Alright, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to the Word from the Lord. James over here with you. Glad you're with us this evening and we're going to be uh, having a Bible discussion with you and I uh, hope you will join in. We'll open the phone lines up and you can call in and, and uh, engage in the Bible discussion uh, on this topic or if you want to deviate, we'll allow a little deviation if you want to. But uh, just to start us off with, um, I want you to consider where you eat. Um, if, you, if you're living in Rockingham County, uh, you probably have gone to restaurants and you've probably seen these little scorecards uh, in, uh, in the window and usually there's a grade there, 90 something or A, something like that, maybe a B. Uh, you might be surprised how many of those, how many places don't have an A rating. On cleanliness or uh, uh, that sort of thing from the health inspector I uh, looked at the at the Rockingham County health uh, uh, internet page web page uh, early this afternoon and uh, just did a little digging around and I was kind of surprised at how many did not have A's I didn't see any that were failing obviously you probably wouldn't find any on there that were failing they'd be closed more than likely but uh, I thought I thought it was pretty interesting the number of of restaurants where people eat that don't have a good score on uh, uh, cleanliness and for some other reasons. So now my point is, if you consider those things where you eat, uh, you would probably you know not eat in the places that were had a bad grade. Now if you uh, went to a place and you saw they had a bad score, what, what would you do? You know, would you go ahead and eat there? Would you really look closely at your food or turn around and walk out? And you probably want to really make sure that uh, that where you're eating is, is clean and sanitary and, and things like that. Now, let me ask you, ask you this. What about where you're eating spiritually? What about what you're eating spiritually? Are you as picky with the spiritual restaurants as you are your uh, physical restaurants? Are you as picky about where you eat uh, spiritually as where you are uh, as where you eat physically? I, I mean, there's some places that people just don't want to eat uh, physically. I mean, they'll say, you know, I'm not going to eat that that kind of food. I mean, I, I know people that won't go to McDonald's. I'm not real crazy about places like McDonald's. I'd rather have something that's a little more. Uh, what you say, less fast foodish, maybe, but you know, I enjoy a good greasy hamburger as well. So I'm not I'm not being a total hypocrite here, but just some restaurants, you know, I just I just can't eat there. <clears throat> now somebody working at McDonald's or on McDonald's, they're probably going to say, well, you know, you need to be quiet. But my point is, people are picky about what they eat and and where they go. But when it comes to where they worship and where they're fed spiritually. They don't really care that much about it. That's what we're going to be talking about uh, this afternoon, this evening. We're going to be discussing how to how to find the best place to eat spiritually. How to find the best spiritual restaurant, if you will, and um, how to know that what you're getting is is good food. So that's where we're going to be this afternoon. And if you want to be part of the program, you can call in. The area code is three three six, and the phone number is four two seven nine six nine six four two seven. WMYN or 627-9563, that's 627-WLOE. You can call me at 276-340-2653, that's 276-340-2653. That's my cell number, you can reach me and we'll put you on the air that way. Uh, or you can reach me at, at email uh, by at, at a word from the Lord at gmail.com, a word from the Lord at gmail.com, <clears throat> and um, we'll be glad to study with you that way. Anything we can do for you, we'll be glad to do that. So hope that you will will study with us. If you want to visit with us, 250 the Boulevard is where we're meeting in Eden, and um, we have Bible studies at Sundays at 9 a.m., 10 a.m. for worship, and Thursday nights at at 7 p.m. for worship as well. So we hope that you will come out and visit with us and and uh, participate in being fed spiritually that way. Now let's get back to the the restaurant. You know, most people I say don't care about what they eat spiritually. I think they're probably uh, they probably look at at where they're fed spiritually about like they would look at where they were being fed or what they were being fed 
physically, you know, what, what is most convenient? Uh, we live in a very convenient uh, society. We like convenience. We like, uh, we like things that can just pop into a microwave. Uh, we like things that are ready to eat out of the box. Uh, we like to grab it and go, drive through, <clears throat> uh, fast food, that, that's, that sort of thing. And so most people, they, you know, they like the convenience. And, and it's true, you know, you can get some food that's very, very convenient that's probably not the best for you. Uh, I know it's really convenient, you know, to go down there to Little Sneezers and get you some, you know, hot and ready's and, and man, you're good to go. I mean, five five fifty five for a pizza and you've got supper on the table. <clears throat> that's that's pretty good. But you know, if you spend a little more time for that same five dollars and prepared your own food, you could probably prepare better food uh, that's better for you. It's just going to take a little bit longer, so it's not as convenient. So people, you know, that's how they choose their. Their, their places to be fed spiritually as well. Well, it's just not convenient. I'm going to go to the church that's closest to me. Uh, this church is just right down the road, and, you know, I, I can I can walk down there and uh, have a good time, come out, feel good, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. Or maybe maybe they cho they're choosing a church like they choose a, a restaurant for their, you know, personal taste. You know, they don't like the, uh, they don't like some, uh, kinds of food so they don't, they don't go to those restaurants. I mean if you don't like if you don't like Mexican food you don't you probably don't go to a Mexican restaurant. Uh, but if you like if you like Chinese food then that's probably where you go. And that's the way people look at at, uh, at churches as well. They want to be fed spiritually according to their preferences. Now that doesn't mean that that's right. You know that doesn't mean that's the best thing for them. I mean Paul said the you know, time will come when they will heap to themselves after their own lust, um, heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Well, not only that, you, you know, having itching ears, they're also going to, you know, have particular tastes, you might say. And so they, they want to be fed certain things. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned to fables. That's Second Timothy 4, uh, verses 2 through 4. So, you know, but but people choose these restaurants like that. There are churches like they choose restaurants. That's that's my point. Uh, maybe the atmosphere. You know, some people are really particular about when they go out to eat. You know, they want a nice sit down restaurant. They want a nice, uh, you know, with some ambience, ambiance. You know, dim lighting and soft music playing, and and then then they look at the church. They look at their church where they want to be fed spiritually. They look at it the same way. You know, only mo they may want, well, we want loud music at church. We want the smoke machines and the mirrors and, the, you know, and the rock and roll bands. Or maybe we want uh, the praise teams and so forth. And so they, they choose that according to their their taste. Or maybe it's just a popular thing to do. Drive by a restaurant, you see everybody lined up. Hey, it must be a good place to eat. Everybody's lined up there. I remember not too long ago, uh, some company came through. I don't remember the name of it now, but they came through and they were selling donuts uh, Somewhere out there, I think it's over there by in Eden. It was uh, over there by McDonald's or uh, the Sprint store or whatever it was, and where the old radio show used to be. And people were just going crazy. Oh, let's get in line to go get these, you know, fancy donuts, or whatever. And it's like uh, my family brought some back home, and I took a bite, and I said, no, you know, yeah, whatever. I could take it or leave it. Not not real keen on it, but everybody else was going crazy about it. Well, why? Because popularity. A lot of times, people just you know whatever's popular, and we talked about that a couple weeks ago. You know, following the crowd. Some people like to do things because that's what's popular, and that's the way it is in religion. People go, they pick a church because they say, "Well, all my friends go there. That's that's the popular thing to do. That's where all the um, that's where all the well-to-do people go, or the well-known people go, and so that's where we're going to go." But you have to come back. To the question, you know, if you're picking where you attend worship, where you where you go to church, or where you're being fed spiritually, if you pick it like you pick a restaurant, does that mean that the food is good for you? You know, just because everybody else likes it, does that mean it's good for you? Just because it's convenient, does that mean it's good for you? Just because, you know, they have clean tables and they play nice soft music while you eat, does that mean the food is good for you? That's really what we're talking about. So... Uh, when you look at the at the religious 
uh, a horizon. When you look out and you see all the different churches in Rockingham County or in surrounding areas, look at them like restaurants. That's how you should look at them. Just for, for the sake of this lesson, just look at them as restaurants. And think about what people are being fed at these different restaurants. Are they being fed spiritually? Are they being fed uh, good food? I mean, what is it? What's the best place? What's the best place to eat? Now, if I ask you what's the best place to eat, you're going to tell me your favorite place. You're going to tell me the place that you like, what tastes the best. That's probably what's going to going to come down to, first of all. And then you're going to tell me some other things that you like about the restaurant. You know, it's it's all you can eat, or it's you know, uh, uh, buy buy one, get one free or something like that. You know, kids eat free on Tuesdays or, or something like that. You're going to tell me something that you like about it. But what about the church where you're being fed spiritually? The friends, that's really what we're wanting to look at. I want you to look at these restaurants, these church restaurants out here, and ask yourself, why are you eating there? Why do you like to go there? Why are you deciding to eat there and be fed spiritually there? Uh, and then let's see if the food is, is what's being good, is really good, the best thing for you. Uh, uh, just a question, how many, how many churches are there? How many restaurants are there? You know, spiritual restaurants, how many spiritual restaurants are there uh, out there? I mean, thousands, right? Hundreds of thousands. And so, you, you know, they're just like restaurants in that regard. You can find one on every corner and, you know, two or three on every block and, and uh, you know, they're all over the place, springing up, popping up and, you know, all kinds of different varieties and styles and flavors. And But again, is that, is that the best thing for you? You know, if you really want to find out what's the best for you, how about talk about the restaurant that the Lord talks about? Now, would you, would you take his recommendation? You know, I think probably if you were asking about where to eat, you would take someone's recommendation over others. Uh, I mean, you just look at the celebrity status. If the celebrity says this is a place to go, everybody goes there. You know, you can take Joe Schmo on the, on the street, and he can say, go eat a place, and people say, well, okay, I might try it. But you get a celebrity to say that, and boy, I mean, it's, you know, it's the best thing since sliced bread. And so everybody flocks there. I mean, that's that's evident just by uh, looking at the commercials on television. If a celebrity will endorse it, then that's that carries a lot of weight with people. So what if the Lord gave you a recommendation? What if the Lord said, you know what, the best place to eat is, and he gave you a place. Would you take that recommendation? Well, if we look at the Bible, that is God's recommendation about where to eat. That is God's recommendation about the best place to be fed spiritually. And... I want to see what he has to say. I want to read his review. You know, I want to read what he has to say about where to eat. Because when you're reading the Bible, you only find one kind of restaurant in the Bible. And, you know, friends, that's that's the Lord's recommendation. The Lord doesn't have all these different tastes and flavors and, you know, whims where he wants to where where he wants us to eat. He has one restaurant, one church where he says you should eat. And that is the one that his son built. The one that his son paid for. Now listen, in Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now whose church was it? Jesus said it's my church. That means it belongs to Jesus. It belongs to Christ. So he only built one, he only built one church. Okay, we've got a phone call coming in. You're on the air. You want to work with the Lord? How about now? Hey, how you doing? I don't feel too good. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm sorry you don't feel well. I've been with that. I ain't heard you say enough about Easter. What about Easter? Well, you first say something about Easter. They eat the day. Okay. Let, let, let me say something about Easter then. In Acts 12, verse 4, the word Easter is only found one time in the Bible. And, uh, e everywhere else it's translated Passover. So, and, and uh, you said about a place of going out to eat. 
My favorite place to go out eat is a good place to go. Brother King. All right. Where, where, do you, where do you eat spiritually? Pleasant View Baptist? Uh, uh, get me a beat, Mac. I don't know, but where do you eat for at church? Where, uh, what's your spirit? Uh, Brother King. Your spiritual restaurant. Where do you, where do you feed yourself spiritually? Uh, Pleasant View Baptist. Uh, yeah, I'll say five. Yeah. Okay. Can you find that? Can you find that in the church? What What does the Lord say about that? Well, you got you got to eat. Well, but you got to eat. But what and, are you uh, What are you eating? That's the That's the key. Well, sometimes I go out and get me a good old fly squad. Okay. And, All right. Well, well, all right. Well, I tell you what, it's good talking to you, and I hope you get feeling better. Okay. All right, and I hope y'all have a good Easter. All right, all right. Let me just say this about Easter. Caller want to say something about Easter. All right. In Acts twelve and verse four, the word Easter is only found one time in the Bible, and actually, it is the word that is translated everywhere else, Passover. And so, really, when you look at the word Easter, I don't know why. You know, we make a big deal about Easter. Easter Sunday, it's the, it's the Sunday, it's the first day of the week that the Jews celebrated the Passover. I mean, obviously Christ raised from the dead on that day, but we observe the Lord's Supper every first day of the week, and we remember the Lord's resurrection, death, burial, and resurrection every first day of the week. So I don't look at Easter Sunday as any more special than any other first day of the week. As a matter of fact, I... If you really want to get right down to it, I observe the resurrection of Christ every first day of the week, and that's why I assemble on the first day of the week, because that's the day he raised from the dead. So, uh, you know, everybody everybody wants to pat, himself, pat themselves on the back for, you know, well, it's Easter, Easter, Easter. Well, what do you do the other 51 Sundays out of the year? So um, I say let's just, you know, let's worship God the way he wants to be worshipped, and we don't have to let uh, Hallmark... Uh, tell us what to observe. You know, we don't have these special days based upon the card company. We can just go to the Bible and worship God the way he wants to be worshipped. All right, so back to our spiritual restaurants here. Let me ask, true or false, the Lord said denominations are part of his church. Now, now you, you, you answer with me, true or false. The Lord said denominations are part of his church. Now, if you answer true, you're wrong. Jesus never said denominations are part of his church. He said, upon this rock I'll build my church. Now, I don't know about you, friends, but if if I were to build a restaurant, I would not recommend someone going somewhere else. Would you? I mean, if you owned a restaurant, would you recommend some? You know what? The best place to eat is not my restaurant. The best place to eat is over here at, at uh, Martin Luther's restaurant. I, I don't think that's where I would go. If Jesus built his church, I'm sure he's going to recommend his church. He's the one that bought it. He paid for it. Shed his blood for it. He said, I'm going to build my church. Now, so we're talking about the singleness of the church. There's only one kind of church in the Bible, friends, and the Bible is very, 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 very clear about that. People say, well, I, I like these particular restaurants. I like these particular churches. Again, we're thinking about re churches as restaurants. I like these particular. I like this particular restaurant. But what does the Lord say about it? The Lord didn't say anything about it. He thought so little about these different man-made churches that he didn't even say he didn't say one word about it. So this notion about well, attend the church of your choice or go to the restaurant of your choice, that's foreign to the Bible. Jesus never said anything like that. Now, Billy Graham said something like that, but Jesus never did. I'm going to take Jesus. See, if, if, if the Lord says, upon this rock I'll build my church, then you only have one choice. You only have one choice. Now, if, if you're given a choice, really the only choice you have is to choose to take it or not, to go there or not. Uh, I, I grew up in a little town in Texas, and... You know, I assume we had we had restaurants that opened up in that town. I don't know that we ever had two restaurants at one time. So like one would open up and then it would close down, and somebody opened another one up. I don't. I'm I'm sure there might have been two restaurants in town at one time, but I just can't remember it. But let's just say there's only one restaurant in town, and you say I'm gonna go out to eat. 
Now, where are you going to go? Well, there's only one place to go. You, you don't have a choice. Either you go to that place or you don't go at all. Now, in Eden, you have a lot of choices. In Madan, Madison, you have a lot of choices. But when it comes to being fed spiritually, you only have one choice. You have the choice of the church that Christ built or you don't have any other choice, not that's approved of by God. And that's what I'm saying, friends. When we're looking at the Bible, there's only one kind. Listen to this. In Acts 20, in verse 28, Paul writes to the elders. He, sa he says to the elders at Ephesus, he says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church, the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. All right? The church, singular. That's what I want you to emphasize. Singular. One one church. One kind. Ephesians 5.25 Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church. Singular. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but they, that it should be holy and without blemish. Friends, there's only one kind of church in the Bible. So, if Christ said upon this rock, I'll build my church, why would you want to go anywhere else? And, and if you really want to be fed spiritually, wouldn't you want to be fed at the place where Jesus said, hey, this is the one I built? Um, if, if, if Jesus had built a restaurant, I think everybody would want to go to it. Uh, that's, that's the one I want to go to. But Jesus built a church, and everybody goes, well, I'm going to go to the one I want to go to. See, that's, that's just not clear thinking. I mean, true or false, the Lord died for his church. That's true. True or false, the Lord died for all churches of men. Go ahead and answer. True or false, the Lord died for all the different denominations. That's false. Jesus didn't die for the, denom the, the denominations. Denominations weren't even thought of. How could he have died for it? How could he have built denominations when they weren't even in existence until at least 600 years after uh, after Christ built his church? How could he have died for something that wasn't, and then it wasn't built for 600 years later? See, friends, the when you talk about the singleness of the church, there's only one. Um, we went over this in class the other night, and uh, I had uh, I had the class notice how many times Jesus, or excuse me, Paul said, talked about the uh, the church in a single uh, manner. In other words, he, he talked about the singularity of the church in Ephesians five in verse twenty three. <clears throat> Notice what uh, Paul says. He says, uh, The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. That's one. And he's the savior of the body. The church is the body, the body is the church. So one church, one body. That's, that's two times in one verse that Paul talks about the singularity of the church. Therefore, as the church, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let their own husbands be in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, singular, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives, uh, as their own bodies, he that loves his wife loves himself. Uh, for no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourish and cherish it, even as Christ, even as the Lord, the church, singular. We are members, I'm in verse uh, 30, Ephesians 5, verse 30, for we are members of his body, singular, and of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, uh, join unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, uh, let every one of you in particular love his wife uh, and the wife says she reverence her husband. So that's uh, at least 11 times uh, where Paul in
in those few verses talks about the singularity of the church. Now, friends, if, if there's only one, why would anyone think that they could choose their own and be in good standing with the Lord? Now, let me ask you this, true or false? Here's another true or false question. True or false, there was only one church in the days of the apostles. Are you with me? There's only one church in the days of the apostles. True or false? That's true. There was only one kind of church in the days of the apostles. Now, why is it we think that it's okay to have more than one kind of church? When you read your Bible, friends, now let's just let's think with me. Let's be honest with ourselves. When you read your Bible, do you ever read of someone asking someone else, well, what member of church are you? What church are you a member of? I said that wrong. What church are you a member of? Where do you go to church? Where do you attend worship? No one ever said that. They never said, where do you go to church? You know why? Because there was only, there was only one church in the New Testament. Now, then you say, well, James, there, there, was, there was Jews. All right, so there's a, that's another religion. But as far as the church that Christ established, you know, th there was only one. Now, friends, today, no one can trace a denomination back further than the Roman Catholic Church. As a matter of fact, when you talk about denominations, they're really denominated from the Roman Catholic Church. They're not denominated, they're not split off and separated from the Lord's Church. So you can't find a denomination back further than the Roman Catholic Church. Now, I've had Baptist preachers tell me they can find the Baptist Church in history, in historical writings, 60 years, you know, after the apostles. But that's, that's just in man's, that's what man wrote. Let's find it in the Bible. Find it in the Bible. You know, if, it, if you can go back 60 years after the apostles, then why don't you just go on back 60 years? You know what I say? You, you can't find these churches in the Bible. So why say, well, I can, I'm going to attend the church of, of my choice. There's only one kind. There's only one kind. Now, you may, you may like where you go to church. You may like to, like being fed there. Uh, call us in. Let's tell, tell us about what you like about the church where you are. 336-427-9696-427-9696-627-9563-627-WLOE. Nine, 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 so you can be part of the program. So in the days of the apostles, no one was, was concerned about going to the church of their choice. So why are we today, friends? Why are we concerned about that today? Now, let me ask you another question. I'm, I'm asking these questions because I want, I want to stimulate your mind. I want to stimulate your, your intellect. I want you to be thinking with me. If, if God approves of all these different denominations, if God, if God is accept, accepts all these different churches of men, why didn't he mention any of them in the Bible? Now, I'm, I'm just thinking out loud here. I'm just, just asking you a question. I want you to be honest with yourself. See, we're not talking, you're not talking to me on the phone, so you're sitting there talking to yourself. Why, why, did, why did God never mention any of these in the Bible? I'm not trying to make you mad. I'm trying to get you to think. If they're all so great and so wonderful, why did God never mention any of them in the Bible? It's because there was only one kind that he wanted men to be a part of. And, and you see that whenever you read the Bible, friends, if you're honest and, you're, and as you're reading the Bible, you will find over and over and over and over and over again the Bible talking about the one church. The one church. Ephesians 1 verse 22 and 23 shows the singularity, the singleness of, of the church. Notice what Paul says. He had put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body. The church and the body are one and the same. And there's only one. 
Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 and verse 4. There is one body. There is one body. Well, if the church is the body, then there's only one church. There's only one church. So, how is it that we can get so many different denominations and claim, well, they all part, they all belong to Christ? Now, the reason I, the reason I started talking about restaurants in the very beginning, for instance, because if Jesus is going to give you, if you're going to be fed by the Word, by the Word of God, there's only one place you can get that. There's only one place you can truly be fed the Word of God in its purest form. Now, you might have some, some adulterated forms of it. You might have some that are tainted. But the best place to get the pure, unadulterated Word of God is in the church that Jesus built. And I, that's, that's where you need to be. This one's what I, what I can get, you know, I can get the Word of God down here at, at uh, St. Joe's Episcopalian Lutheran number seven. Well, you can get you can get a version of it, I guess you can say, some watered down something that calls that. That's just like you can say, well, you know, I've eaten I've eaten a steak before. Have you? Where did you eat a steak? Well, it was a, it was from this little streetcar place, and they had a, it was frozen, but it was a steak. Okay, it was a piece of meat, but that's not the same as getting the, the best steak at the steakhouse. So you can say, well, it came off of a cow. Okay. So that don't mean it's a steak, see? I'm saying the best place to eat is the place where is, is the place where Christ founded it. That's 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 what's on the menu there, is his word. And you just really can't get that anywhere else. Um it tickles me these people that, that say, well, you know, they go to a uh seafood place they go to a seafood place and they're going to order spaghetti okay well I mean you can get spaghetti there but I always wonder why if you're going to a seafood place why don't you order what they're known for I mean they're known for seafood if you want spaghetti go to an Italian place right but if you want seafood eat seafood or if you're going to a seafood restaurant eat seafood if you want the Bible, if you want the Word of God, why don't you go to Christ, to Christ uh, Church, to His house? You remember this in John uh, six, in John six and verse sixty-six. Uh, Jesus, from that time, the Bible says, from that time, many of His disciples went back and walked no more with Him. Then Jesus said unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, here's what I'm saying, friends. If you really want the best spiritual food, you want the pure and adulterated word of God, you need to go to the house that Christ built. You need to sit down in his restaurant and be fed with his word. Because if you're in a place... If you're in a place that just talks about serving the Word of God, you're not getting the best. You're not getting the best. All right, let me ask you a question. True or false? The church is the bride of Christ. The church is the bride of, is the bride of Christ. Well, let's read a little bit. Ephesians 5, verses 22 and 23. We read this a little bit ago. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Eat. As unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the savior of the body. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So true or false, the church is the bride of Christ. That's true. The church is the bride of Christ. Now, why do I why don't I ask that? Well, what did Jesus teach about marriage? What did Jesus teach about marriage? Jesus said there's one man and one woman. That's, that's, that's marriage. 
one man, one woman for life. That was that was always his intent. Matthew, uh, Matthew nineteen, Matthew nineteen and verse uh, six. Jesus said, uh, verse four. Jesus said, "Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh." Wherefore there are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. So that was God, that was God's law on marriage: one man, one woman. Well, if the church is the bride of Christ, how do you think Christ feels about being married to more than one bride? I mean, here's what Paul said in Romans seven. Paul said, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead. So Paul says, You're married to Christ. You're married to Christ. I, I, he said, uh, I am uh, uh, jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. So, Christ's law of marriage, one man, one woman for life. That's, that's how he intended it. Now, did Jesus teach one thing and practice another? If the church is the bride of Christ, if the church is the bride of Christ, then why is it that everybody claims to be married to Christ? All these different churches of men, they, they claim, well, we, we're married to Christ. We're part of the bride of Christ. No, Christ doesn't play that way. Christ has one bride. It's his church. Now, you, you, don't, you don't put all these different denominations together and say, well, they make up the bride of Christ. And they're all called by different names. You know, what do you think, what do you think my wife would do if I came home and said, you know what? I, I, I've got uh, I've got five or six girls out here, and collectively they they are my wife singular. Are you crazy? Ain't nobody buying that. No, no one would buy that. But yet, when it comes to religion, everybody says, "Well, the church is the bride of Christ, and we're all part of the bride of Christ." No, 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 no. Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, whatever, they, they don't get to say they're part of the bride of Christ. They are a different, they're a different person. They're a different bride. They're a different, uh, different body. Christ is only married to one church. He has one bride. See, he doesn't teach, he doesn't teach one man, one woman when it comes to physical marriage and turn around and do something different spiritually and say, well, I'm, I'm going to be married to four or five people. And again, if if all these denominations are approved of by God, why could not a person be a member of several churches? Now, I know some people that aren't members of any church. You know, they, they roam around and they go here and there and whatever. But I don't know of anybody that really claims to be a member of several churches. And most places, want you, you're either going to be a member there or, or not. Now, they're glad you visit. And they sure want you to put your money in a plate, but, you know, if you're going to be a member there, you're going to be identified with them. I remember talking to a man one time we were door knocking. He said, you know, I, uh, I'm really, a, uh, I believe he said a Methodist, but I've been going down here to the Brethren Church. And he said they wanted me to join, but I wasn't going to be baptized again uh, in the Brethren Church. So they just, you know, they quit, they quit talking to me. Well, he really wasn't a member of the Brethren Church. He's still a Methodist. And as I'm saying, friends, if all these churches are the same, why, why doesn't anybody claim to be a member of all the different churches? Why isn't there someone out here going, well, you know, well, where do you go to church, uh, Tom? Where do you go to church? Well, I'm a Roman Catholic, I'm a Roman Episcopalian Methodical Assembly of the Baptist Lutheran Church, number seven. Over on the service road. No, no one says that. 
And, and the reason why is because they know, they know that you really can't be a member of all these different churches. Now, I saw a quote one time, Billy Graham, I couldn't find. I know I have it, and I'd have to, and I looked for it, and I couldn't find it. But Billy Graham said one time he felt he was a member of all churches, but he was still a Southern Baptist. And I wonder why. I wonder why he was still a Southern Baptist. And for all this time, he felt a bit as a member of all churches. You know why? Because singularity, singularity is, is, is important. It's important to be a member of one church. And everybody knows the Bible talks about one church. And so everybody thinks that the church they're in is right. Whether they want to admit it or not, that's what they think. And so they make distinctions. That's why they make distinctions. That's why they call themselves different names. That's why they say we're Episcopalian or we're Baptist or Lutheran or Presbyterian or whatever. Because they, they know they need to be distinct or different. But friends, when we're talking about the one church and, and the need to be a part of the one church, I just can't stress enough because that's, that's what Christ died for. And if you're, if you're a member of a church that you can't read about in the Bible, I really wish you'd consider, why is that? Why, why am I a member of a church that I, I don't even read about in the Bible? I mean, what gives, you the, what gives you the idea that God is pleased with that when he didn't say anything about it? Now, when I talk about one church, I, oftentimes you get objections. People say, well... You know, uh, we just we just can't all understand the Bible alike. Therefore, there just can't be one. There just can't be one church because we're we're all different. We all uh, do things differently. We all you know whatever. They have all kinds of excuses. But I want you to I want you to consider something. Friends, God, when God is determined to save people. In any, in any given time, any way he chooses to save people, he always chose to save them the same way each time. What do I mean by that? I mean, here's what I mean by that. When God said to Noah, build an ark, you go back and read Genesis 6. When God said build an ark, there was only one way to be saved in that scenario. There was only one way that God intended for men to be saved. That was in the ark. So if you were going to be saved, you had to be in the ark. If you weren't going to be saved, you were not in the ark. That's all there is to it. No one, no one says that somebody was saved outside of the ark. No one in their right mind would say that. And, and no one you know, who, who uh, uh, has studied the Bible would say, yeah, there were some people that saved outside of the ark. So my point is, when God says, I'm going to save people, he chooses to save them all the same way. All right? When, when Israel crossed the Red Sea, when Israel escaped out of Egyptian bondage, they were all saved the same way. They were, they were all saved the same way. Uh, I mean, just, just go back and read it. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 Paul said, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all had to go through the Red Sea in order to be saved. No, no, nobody in Israel was saved by going around the Red Sea. No one was saved by walking on the water. So when God saves somebody, he saves them all the same way. Whenever there's a time that God says, I'm going to save people or I'm going to give them deliverance, it's going to be the same way. Now, let's, let's bring that to the church. God says today, I'm going to save people. And I'm going to save them by the gospel. The gospel is the power of God to save. That gospel tells people about the church, the one kind of church. 
And then men come along and go, well, I think we can be saved in different churches. Even after Christ said, upon this rock I build my church. Even after Paul says in Ephesians 5, he is the savior of the body, singular. Someone comes along and says, I think I can be saved in a different way. No, friends, you, you, you can't. You can't. Now, somebody says, well, we just can't understand the Bible alike. You know, we just can't understand the Bible alike. Friends, is, is man's confusion on the Bible our fault or is it God's fault? Because when you say we can't understand the Bible alike, you're really putting the blame right on God. Let me give you an example. In 1 Samuel 15, verses 13 through 14, Samuel came to Saul. God has told Saul, utterly destroy the Amalekites. Don't spare anybody. Don't spare the king. Don't spare the flocks. Utterly destroy them. Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Now, Saul could have said, well, you know, uh, the Lord said utterly destroy, and so I utterly destroyed it. It kind of depends on how you define that word, you know. That's kind of an archaic word. I don't really know what it means for sure, and so I just, you know, that's my interpretation was I could spare the flocks and I could spare some of the sheep and some of the cows and, you know, and King Agag, I could spare them and still do what God says. Friends, it was very, very clear what God said do. The problem was Saul chose to misunderstand. He chose to misunderstand. People don't misunderstand the Bible because they can't understand it. They misunderstand the Bible because they choose to misunderstand it. They choose not to accept what the Bible says. Now, that's, that's really why there's all these differences. See, friends, man can, man can write all kinds of literature and people can understand it. Man can write all kinds of books and people can understand it. They can write owner's manuals and phone books and almanacs and, uh, you know, you just name it. Some of them may be more difficult than others, but they can all be understood. God, the great author, by the Holy Spirit guides men to write his will and man comes along and goes, yeah, I just don't get that. I just don't understand that. You're saying that God can't write a book that we can understand? My point is when men read the Bible and they read Jesus say, upon this rock I'll build my, my church, you have to willingly misunderstand what that means in order to say one church is just as good as another. You have to either ignore it, overlook it, whatever. But, so it's, it's not a matter of we can't understand the Bible like. It's that people just don't want to understand the Bible like. I've said this before. People change the Bible. Like the Jehovah's Witness, they change the Bible. They make their own version of the Bible not because they can't understand the Bible and they need it. They need some clarification. They change the Bible because they can understand it. And they realize, hey, if we don't change this, then it's going just to, you know, eliminate, eliminate our doctrine, our belief. That's why Martin Luther, you know, he, he didn't like, um, he didn't like the book of James. Because James says you're saved by works and not faith only. And so he didn't like that because well, it went against what he, what he believed. But friends, let me ask you this. If, if all churches are right, if they're all right, if they're all correct, then why do people give me so much grief when I'm saying that all churches are not right? Because, stay with me. If all churches are right, then that includes that includes the church that I'm in, and that includes the doctrine that the Bible teaches that all churches are not right. 
So, thanks for saying that what I'm saying is right. If all churches are right, it would have to include it have to include the group that says everybody can't be right. I mean, that's just all there is to it. And friend, I, I, I'm wanting you to think here. Would all churches, if all churches are right, then we'd all be saying the same thing. I mean, the reason why one church is wrong compared to another is because somebody's teaching something different. I mean, if you had two teachers and one teacher is teaching one plus one is three and the other is teaching one plus one is two, everybody's going to say, well, the one that comes up with the number three is wrong. Why? Because truth says one plus one is two. It will always be two. It will never be anything but two. Now, true or false? New Testament preachers taught differing doctrines. Is that true or false? Now, there's some out there that are going to say that's true, but that's false. It's really false. New Testament teachers did not teach different doctrines. Now, there's some people that are going to say they did, and they'll tell you, well, Peter taught one thing to the Jews, and Paul taught another thing to the Gentiles, and they come up with, with two different doctrines. But remember what we said a little bit ago? When God chooses to save people, he does it the same way. He's not going to choose to save Jews in one dispensation and Gentiles in the same dispensation a different way. Now you might say, well, James, you said, well, John, you know, John was preaching to the Jews. Yeah, that was before Christ died. And so you can't, you can't change. You can't say they're teaching different doctrines because everywhere they went, they taught the same thing. I mean, I can show you where Paul was actually teaching to some of the same people that Peter was teaching. And they didn't have any problem teaching the same thing to Jews and Gentiles. Um, in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 17, Paul said, For this cause I uh, send unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Paul is sending Timothy <clears throat> to Corinth. Now, Timothy is going to teach the same thing Paul taught. He's going to teach the same thing that Paul taught in Corinth. And when we get to 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul is going to write Timothy, and we find out he's in Ephesus. Now, if you've got a Bible map, if you've got your Bible there, open find uh, your Bible map, and find Corinth and find Ephesus. And you'll find that they are across the Aegean Sea. They're on the they got a whole large body of water between them. One's in Asia Minor, one's not. And so you have Corinth and Ephesus being told the same thing. Because Timothy is going to teach the same thing in Corinth that Paul did, and he's going to teach the same thing in Ephesus when he gets there. And then Paul said, I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia that thou mightest charge some of the teaching of the doctrine. So Paul is going up to Macedonia, where it's Thessalonica and Philippi, things like that. Corinth is in Achaia. That's uh, south of uh, Macedonia. But Paul is teaching the same thing. He's teaching the same, he's teaching the same thing in Thessalonica. He's teaching the same thing in Macedonia. He's teaching the same thing in Philippi. He's teaching the same thing in Corinth. He's teaching the same thing in Ephesus. And when, when Timothy comes through and he gets into Corinth, he's going to teach the same thing that Paul was teaching. And he's going to teach the same thing in Ephesus that Paul was teaching because Paul has been to Ephesus as well. And so when you look at the Bible, these folks are all going to the same, same places and they're all teaching the same things. To the Corinthians, Paul said, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the church of Galatia, even so do ye. Galatia is back over there in Asia Minor. And all the churches in Galatia heard the same thing that Paul taught in Ephesus and Macedonia and Achaia, Corinth, Philippi, Thessalonica, and so forth. 
They all have the same thing. And it's because all churches received the same doctrine. Someone says, well, James, you know what it says? It says they're churches of Christ, churches of God. Well, friends, that doesn't mean that they're different kinds. That just means they're in different places, but they're the same kind of church. And so, friends, that's, that's why I'm trying to stress to you that you need to be a part of the church you read about in the Bible, and you need to find the church that you read about in the Bible. And if, if I can't find it in the Bible, I'm not going to tell you that it's in the Bible. And I hope that you would be honest enough with yourself to tell yourself, you know what, I'm in a church that I can't even find in the Bible. You might can find it in the yellow pages, but you can't find it in the Bible. Now, why would you be in that? Why, why would you be willing to stay in a church that you know God never talked about? It can't be a bride of Christ. It can't be part of the bride of Christ because Christ only married to one woman, one bride, right? It can't be it can't be the uh, one body that you read about in the Bible because it's following different laws. I mean, that's what makes it distinctive from all the other churches. There was only one church in the Apostles' Day. So, if you're in a church that started after the first century, after, you know, 33 A.D., you're too late. You know, you, you started way too late. And so that's what we're saying, let's get back to the Bible. I mean, if you're in a church that's not in the Bible, you're in a church that Christ didn't die for. And you say, well, James, that's kind of harsh. Well, I, you know, I don't mean for it to be harsh. I'm just saying it's the truth. And I'm, I'm just trying to uh, get you to examine, investigate. I mean, $1,000, if you can find a different kind of church in the Bible other than the church of Christ, same as the church of God, I mean, their organization, what they teach, what they practice, are all the same. You find, find a denomination, find the Baptist, let's be specific here, find the Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, whatever, find it in the Bible, $1,000. You can't find it. And so the way that people justify being in these churches, they say, well, it don't matter. They say, well, it just doesn't matter what church you're in. Well, if it doesn't matter what church you're in, then why do you insist that you're part of the church of Christ, that you're part of the body of Christ or the bride of Christ? It must matter to you in that regard because everybody wants to be a part of the church of Christ, the church that Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. It's just, it's not important Church is not important when it comes to finding in the Bible, but you know it's important because you know Christ died for it. You know the, the saved are in the church. You know that Christ is married to the church, so you know it's important. But it's just when it comes to finding in the Bible, you don't think it's important enough to find it. And I'm going to tell you, friends, when, when Paul said in Ephesians 5, in verse 23, when he says that Christ is the head of the church and the Savior of the body, it's important. You want to be a part of the church that you read about in the Bible. You want to be a part of the church that you read about in the Bible so that you can be a part of the bride of Christ and part of the body that's going to be saved. If you want to find the church that that's concerned about your soul and will teach you the unadulterated word of truth. We meet at 250 the Boulevard in Eden. Sunday at 9 a.m., 10 a.m. for worship. Thursdays at 7 p.m. for Bible study. I'll be glad to I'll be glad to study with you, help you any way I can. My number is 276-340-2653. 276-340-2653. A word from the Lord at gmail.com. A word from the Lord at gmail.com. If I can assist you anyway, let me do that. I always make sure that what you're getting, friends, is a word from the Lord. God bless and have a good night.